My genuine memory of my first experiences with wine were around four or five. At that time, I was visiting my grandparents and there was a vineyard uh, that they had established. Of course, there was always wine on the table and there's always a craft and it was just right out of the barrel all, all the time. And at five, they were giving me a little bit of wine mixed with water. That was the standard. And I remember the winemaking process early on and seeing them pressing out the, the juice and the fermentation and all that. And I was just very curious at the time. Little did I know what impact that was to have for me. So when I was about 20, my wife, uh, Nancy and I were in a little apartment and there was a row of grapes of different colors along the fence line. I asked the old guy who was a Seventh-day Adventist if I could have some of the grapes on my side of the fence. And he, well, what do you want to do with them? I says, well, we're going to make some jam. He goes, oh, sure, take some, you know. I made, oh, probably five gallons off of this. Well, it was very cloudy and I thought undrinkable. I let my brothers have it and they drank it all. You know, so. <laughs> so that was my first venture into winemaking. So I made wine pretty intensively for about eight years as a home winemaker. And so I made all my mistakes on those early wines. I was in the reserves, a good friend of mine, uh, Rick Small, uh, who has Woodward Canyon Winery. He and I would go off to places in the United States for training and, and, for, and, and to train others. And so while we were in California, of course, we hit the wine trail and every tasting room we could find and we we're always going off and tasting wines and whatnot. It became kind of a, a fascination. We're learning so much and jamming so much in in the whole wine world, just like sponges, just taking it all in. This whole wine thing became quite serious I would say the mid to late 70s, when I was making some pretty good homemade wines, met, met a friend over in the Columbia Basin Tri-Cities area. He had a vineyard. We struck a deal, hey, let me, let's make a little wine off your vineyard and we'll share the wine. And he goes, great, let's do it. So in 75, we started making some vinifera. We made Cabernet. Right away was just really good. I learned so much making homemade wine and reading all the regions of the world, packing all my library and just vociferously pouring over all these books. That was kind of the beginning. We became Bonner Winery number 67 in 1977, and we were the first winery in Walla Walla. Everybody thought it was a funny thing. There wasn't really a wine culture here. A lot of the old Italians died off, and along with, with that, any little small postage stamp vineyards that were around, and nobody was really making wine except for maybe just a couple crazy guys like me making homemade wine. I chose the name Leonetti because uh, of my influence and my time spent out at the family farm as a youth. The name Leonetti had, had some cachet. I think people really responded to it and, it and it was bonafide too. My mother was a Leonetti. I had no idea that I had the entrepreneurial spirit until I started planting that seed from my early successes with, with red wines, especially vinifera. It just was fermenting in my mind and in my heart. The biggest challenge was how am I gonna tell Nancy I would, wouldn't mind making a little wine to sell? That was quite a challenge to get over, over that hump. And, and I finally just said, okay, here's what I'd like to do. And wouldn't it be fun if we could make a little money to put the, uh, the kids through college? I had no idea we were gonna be as wildly successful as we, as we became. The economics of getting into making wine for us was so basically primitive and we had zero money. We were raising two kids and I had a, a day job in a factory uh, as a laborer and gradually worked up and, and became a machinist in that same factory and worked with my dad who was a tool and die maker there. Everything that we did within that initial startup phase, thinking we wanted to do this, was all just handmade stuff, just whatever we could pick up. I found some old stainless steel pickling vats out of the local cannery and uh, was able to get those for a song. And I built some pump stands and uh, bought this little magnetic drive pump and uh, everything very, very simple and, and, and cheap. <laughs> Here's some crazy young guy thinks he wants to 
make a few bucks doing, doing this when nobody else around is doing it in our valley. We made our first wine, our 1978 Cabernet, and it was a blend of my friend's vineyard in the Tri-Cities area and, and grapes that we had planted in 74. It was stunning. We were just amazed how good it was. At one time, the uh, Wine and Spirits magazine, they were going to do a judging and, and, and figure out what's the best wine in the nation. And we thought, oh gosh, do we really want to send off a couple bottles? They wanted a couple bottles. W what the heck? And so we sent them off anyway and forgot about it. And then it was, oh, a couple months later, my wife calls me at work. I go, hey, honey, what's going on? And she says, honey, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> Even today, I get the upwellings because that was such a time that was such an incredible emotional lift. It launched us. God, we, you won this thing, your best cap in the nation. <laughs> I think that anybody who is very passionate about wine starts in this business. They all want and need that big boost. It's such a wonderful thing to get that to launch a new brand. There's another 10 years of building that business while I kept my day job. In 1988, from that first 78 vintage, uh, I, I quit my day job. People thought I was crazy. Consecutively, we established this reputation for Cabernet and for Merlot. That was the big deal at the, at the time. The reason why we picked the Bordeaux varieties was because our region is Region 2, Low Region 3, which our heat units are the same as Oakville, Napa Valley. So year in and year out, they may vary a little bit, but that's where we sit. The, the Bordeaux varieties were the ones that were going to prove to be the ones to, to make the best wines out of. At one time, the wine spectator called us the ma master of Merlot. And we were making these gorgeous, grapey, just fleshy, fruity Merlots. They weren't especially long lived but they were glorious when you popped the cork. And uh, so I paid a, a visit to Napa Valley and went into some of these restaurants saying, oh, all the Napa Valley winemakers are coming in and they're buying your wine. They want to see what you're doing with, <laughs> with Merlot. Of course, Merlot appears a different creature than down there. Today, our Merlots are bigger, longer lived. As a mature winery, I always kept that style going. As the winery matured and people understood more, we gradually increased the, the size and the structure of our wines. When we won the best cab in the nation with the 1978 Cabernet, we weren't necessarily locked into any style. However, I settled on, on an international style or classically proportioned with good balance, fruit, wood, oak. I did deviate from time to time on the style. Merlots were the first one to get that softening process because it was a natural for that. Let Merlot be Merlot, let Cabernet be Cabernet. My son put it well when he said that dad was making Michel Roland type wines before Michel Roland. <laughs> Well, the price quality ratio has always been very paramount for us, very conscious of our customers, how we can get more for our product as well. We're not Napa Valley, we're Washington State. More importantly, we're Walla Walla Valley. And so we've always raised our prices just in small increments. Even after the big 78 thing hit, we were still just mom and pop, you know, and you, you can't just all of a sudden go to the stratosphere with pricing and expect to, to get people to tag along. So we'd always do it slowly, you know, $5 at a time, a vintage, and uh, it'd go on like that. Also, it's changing now, but vineyard pricing and costs of production are less. It's, it's lower than uh, in some of the more established regions with a long history, like Napa. But here's something very interesting. Walla Walla Valley has more 90 plus rated wines than any other region in the world. Now that is pretty incredible. That can extend to the whole of Washington state as well and to other regions, but primarily Walla Walla. The time is gonna come when this region will have that cachet. People are already saying Walla Walla has more cachet than Washington State as a whole. People are coming, you build it and they'll come and they have and they're buying these great wines and they're, they're finding real bargains here too. The slow go was the thing that worked for us. It doesn't work for everybody. But so often I've seen too many people make too much because they've had early successes and then they double or triple production 
And then they're in a position where they have a lot of juice to sell. And so they, all of a sudden they've got to not only be a winemaker, be a marketer and figure out how they're going to move that product into the marketing scheme and how you're going to do that. That's tough. We are an allocated winery, which means that we have a subscription list and we have a list of distributors. We send out our mailer and, and people uh, can have, have the opportunity to, to buy our wines. We're not open to the public. We chose to do it that way because our house is, uh, is about 30 steps away from where we're sitting right now. And so we didn't want the tail to wag the dog. It was a way of controlling it. And also because our, our wines are sought after and we're low, lower production, it was a natural fit. It wasn't like a, a moment of genius or inspiration. It's just something we, we had to do out of necessity and we stuck with it and it works and people have responded in kind to it. And so that's how we've, we've managed that. Direct consumer sales are roughly around 65% to 70%. Building mailing list was a real challenge. You absolutely have to start slow. So over time, yes, we had some potential issues. We had to be transcending all the state's laws and all that is quite a challenge. It provides us with the retail sales, which really is the bread and butter of most wineries of our size. We have been all the states since 1999, and we just had to get total control of the vineyards. In the early days, my wife and I and Chris were making really damn good wines from higher cropped vineyards. That just shows the quality of our region that you can get even larger crops and still make really good wines. What really drove us to going estate vineyards was several freezes in Washington that most people were aware happened and uh, we can have loss of crop because of these low minimum temperatures. We really needed to push the hillsides because cold air runs downhill, and pools up in the, in the lower vineyards. And so as our winery matured, we were taking some of those proceeds and pushing the hills, buying pieces of ground in the hillsides, and then planting our own grapes, managing our own viticulture, and lowering our crop yields. And we lowered the crop yields also as a direct benefit for quality, but also to not stress those vines, not push them too far. They became more winter hardy in the process. In the whole scheme of trying to achieve that, we've achieved this stupendous quality. And from one side of the valley to the other, it changes the style of these grapes. You know, you get a little higher elevations and to the east and, and north of the valley, you get more, more size, more minerality, structure, higher tannins. And so, and on the other side of the valley, yeah, more, more, more flowery, more fruity characters that uh, at the same types of uh, elevations and different soil types from, from one to the other. The evolution of our, you know, of our business model from just Leonetti to these other things happened somewhat organically. We had grown Leonetti to become 100% estate grown, and that was super gratifying. So in some ways, I was always adding on to the business, but just within Leonetti of adding these estate sites, we'd acquired land, planted these vineyards, developed them, completely transitioned us away from a uh, purchased fruit to estate grown, and that was very satisfying. We finished the winery in about 2000, our new production facility. And between my parents and I, we both kind of decided, okay, we, we've got this thing where we want it production wise. We're fully estate grown. We're even selling a little extra fruit. But here I am in my, in my 30s and I, I just couldn't kind of imagine that being it. There was something more and that something more kind of reached out and grabbed me when I found uh, the what would become the Figgins Estate site. And I found this piece of property came available from a, a family that was, uh, the, the dad had died and they were, they were divesting themselves of a few pieces of smaller farm ground. And there was a 55 acre parcel that was, it was perfect. 1500 to 1750 feet, south, southwest slopes, deep wall to wall of silt loams, rolling terrain, it just had everything I looked for. I talked with my parents about it and they were, okay, we're, we're done, you know, no more, no more vineyard sites. We, you know, we've got what we need for Lee Nettie and, and we did. So with a, you know, kind of a slow tug of war, it's like, well, what if I do this? And, and they're like, on your own, yes, you know? <laughs> so I felt strongly enough about the site that I, felt it warranted being a single vineyard project. 
and it definitely would have made more sense from a business perspective, short term, to bring it into Leonetti, have it be a, a Leonetti single vineyard, the Figgins Vineyard. The name of it, incidentally, is honoring the other side of my family. My, my grandma, Leonetti, married my grandpa Figgins. It's a Leonetti-Figgins connection. I love that old world model where the the vineyard, the winery, the wine is one thing, it's a continuum, and it's, it's about the place. And the varietal makeup is, uh, is a, a point of interest, but it's not critical to the wine. It's about the place and tasting the wine, tasting the place uh, in the glass, and just seeing vintage variation rather than, than so focused on the varietal makeup. It was more, much more of a horizontal move. It was a, a sister winery to Leonetti. I very much wanted to avoid the, the second label curse. I knew it had to have its own facility. Also have an assistant winemaker there to me. So I, the winemaker both, but have separate assistant winemakers. That said, we taste together, we, we collaborate and uh, trying to understand what, what we're doing at each property. But it definitely was a horizontal move and priced it as such because I felt that the vineyard justified it and it does and it's been an amazing addition to Leonetti to have this wine that's that's terroir on a very small micro level one vineyard whereas Leonetti is, is terroir on a mezzo level you know across the Walla Walla Valley blended from five vineyards. Once we established Figgins it, it became clear that from a branding marketing perspective we had to have a way to to tie them together that was clear to the customer and also create room for this Pinot Noir from Oregon that I had simmering in the back of my crock pot that would later come to fruition. But so we created Figgins Family Wine Estates as a umbrella company, if you will, that markets together and ties Figgins together and Leonetti together, handles, admin, compliance, the bookkeeping aspects, marketing, dealing with distributors, all of those those things that, you know, the unsexy part of the wine business that's so very important to the wine business being successful. And Figgins Family Wine Estates is that that link that ties together all, all three. So with the Lean Eddy main list, we, we decided early on that that's sort of a, a sacred thing in terms of someone's spot on there. You know, it's such a coveted position from the start. and and people have this long wait, you know, three years, five years, seven years to get on, that we didn't want to just cross market uh, directly. One of the most annoying things to me as a consumer is when I buy from one company and all of a sudden I'm getting catalogs from their four other sister companies. And we wanted to avoid that from the start, so we did a, a one-time offering like, hey, we're opening this new thing, Lean Eddy customers. It's up to you to choose to join, and we maintain. So there's a separate list for Leonetti, separate list for Figgins, separate list for Toil Oregon. We have customers on two, we have customers on all three. We have some that are just on one. We keep them separate very intentionally um, to, to help have their own brand identity and not be muddled across them. The state planning thing, so it takes some time, and you have to have really good legal counsel in order to be able to pass uh, uh, some assets on without tax consequences, obviously. That's the whole idea behind estate planning. But the whole operational thing was tough because the kids were involved. We had to get them actively involved. And I thought the best thing we could possibly do is to make them partners because then they're gonna take care of what they're bestowed with. And it worked out beautifully. We continue to search for the best ways to do this and still but seek a balance and keep some of the assets to provide yourself with a good life un until it's it's time for you to turn the whole thing over completely. So. <laughs> Chris uh, has been here 20 plus years, I believe, even in grade school and junior high. We'd have little walks around the property and just talked about it. And I always thought, I'm not gonna push this kid because uh, he's the heir apparent as far as the winemaker goes. I'm just gonna make little subtle suggestions. You know, some of this could be yours, you know, and if you ever have the inclination to do it. And didn't have too many conversations along those lines, just a, a, a few things. We just let him have his way. But here's a job, you know, you know, come home from college, you work in the cellar and help with the crush and all that. And then uh, he was significantly involved in designing and building the, the new winery. It's just kind of a natural fit. Amy was a little tougher nut to crack, 
She, uh, she kind of went into corporate America for a time and uh, became a cost analysis engineer. Of course, she had the whole business marketing experience at Washington State University. Big deal. <laughs> I always talk to her. I said, oh, 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 come in. You know, your brother's in. I might be pretty good, you know. I wasn't hired as the winemaker, you know. I didn't uh, fill out a job interview, obviously. It was a process, so my dad, he's kind of a natural teacher, natural instructor, and, and there was never a day uh, along that line where all of a sudden I was the head winemaker. It was a slow tug of war, if you will, for you know, me wanting more and more responsibility, more and more of, of decision-making and control-making ability. And I think about 2001 is when I was finally given the title of of winemaker. That was, uh, I think, definitely a big deal for me in terms of building confidence, you know, at that point in my career. Working with my parents was, has changed so much over time. So early on, it was, it was very difficult to separate personal from professional. The, the lines were completely muddled. You never had a family get together for, you know, Christmas, Thanksgiving, a Sunday dinner that didn't also talk about business, talk about the wine business, and, and always all consuming wine, wine, wine. 10 to 12 years ago, we got some professional help, and I think that was absolutely critical to our success in establishing boundaries, boundaries of personal life and professional life, boundaries of knowing, okay, now's the end of talking wine. Let's actually be a family so you can enjoy each other as a family and not just be always focused on the business because the nature of the wine business is all consuming, especially if you're going to be successful at it. You're not thinking about it Monday through Friday. You're thinking about it all the time. You're discussing things all the time. Your arguments or disagreements end up being discussed over Sunday dinner instead of talking about you know, the kids or fishing or the weather or whatever. Dad's got his nose in the blends you know, still, but it's interesting, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're constantly pushing dad, trying to establish your territory, pushing dad out. In my 30s, we started, you know, establish some sort of equilibrium, and now that I'm in my 40s, it's like, dad, come, you know, come taste. Hey, we're blending this afternoon. Come, you know, wanting, trying to pull him back in from fishing or cabin or whatever he's, he's doing to get him back involved in his nose in a glass with me, because obviously I still value his palate, his perspective on, on the style of our wines over time, so I love having him involved when it's when possible. Definitely my dad has been a, a business mentor, but more than a business mentor, he's been a, a craft mentor. My dad's very much a craftsman, you know, he was a machinist by trade, and he's always been a detail mentor very, very qualitatively focused. And so he was not so much a business mentor as, as a leading by example on the craft side. It was always run very well, and so much so because of my mother and her attention to detail and taking care of customers and literally running down the hallway when the phone rings because that could be a case of wine to sell. She'd spend hours looking for a penny if the checkbook didn't balance. So my mom was always the business glue. And then I, I think, brought some a little more yearnings to professional business running. And then when my sister came in, she had spent some time in the corporate world. She very much had a professional business mindset, which I think was good for all three of us in terms of expectations, how things are run, and just running things professionally. They proceeded in a way that was slow and methodical because they weren't classically trained business people. Most people who, had they had the success my parents had when they were young and the wine started to get attention in the press and as you, you know, leverage yourself to the hill, you build, 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 and they didn't do that. I think they were scared to do that. They went slow and they didn't borrow money. They, their budget was a checkbook. If it had money in it, you could afford something. If it didn't, you couldn't. And because they went so slow, it, it established such a firm foundation that when I came into the business, it was just starting to reach you know, real profitability after 20 years. We were able to plow that back in and not just service debt. We were able to acquire land and plant vineyards, build a new winery that was timely. And I think that from a business perspective is, is what I'm most proud of. And also what we have as a family, any wealth that we have as a family is 100% because of wine. We didn't sell a tech company and then buy ourselves a legacy or buy ourselves a winery. We did it from the ground up 
and a lot of hard work and a lot of bootstrapping. That's what I'm most proud of. There's lots of opportunities here in the Valley or, or elsewhere in the state. Uh, they're going to take that education and everything they've learned from here and they're going to make it big.